If you have a baby <clears throat> and they take your baby away to weigh it, and they come in hospital and they come back and say to you, uh, we've got some good news and some bad news. Okay, the bad news first. Uh, we've lost the name tags. We don't know which baby's yours. But the good news is we've had some fantastic babies born this morning. They're really wonderful. Super, super healthy. They look lovely. It's like, it's like choosing a puppy, you know, go and choose one that you... It doesn't work, does it? We're also an incredible tribal species. <clears throat> And unfortunately, our leaders now are stimulating this side, this dark side of our, our potential over and over. So what this means is that we know that every five seconds a child dies of starvation, well, we live like this. And we also know that in the European and American markets, we throw a lot of our food away. Many kids grew up in these environments, where some of us will grow up in these environments. The, distance, the difference between the haves, have-nots, and have-lots is massive. Something like 10 families own 85% of the wealth or something like that. It's quite amazing. Why would you, this is not a religious thing, but why would you want to invent this way to kill somebody? It was the most horrendous way to die. I'm very interested in Roman history because Roman history is an immensely cruel, callous uh, uh, culture. It's fascinating how it became like that. And the thing is, you could walk out of the gates of some of the big cities and you'd hear people screaming, begging to die, and you'd walk past them just like you would walk past the beggars in the streets. And this went on for 700 years. Quite extraordinary. Now, what are all these people here, you know? 10,000 people were killed in the first three months of the Colosseum. Between 500,000 and a million might have died over the life of the Colosseum. Okay. Extraordinary. Are these all psychopaths? I don't think so. Are they genetically different to you and me? I don't think so. They live in a different culture, and that culture allows this kind of behavior. And the point is, that means this behavior, to go on for so long, is a potential within the human mind. Be careful what you stimulate in the human mind, because the human mind is a pretty horrible thing. Some of the battles, I mean, I often see these battles on television, and I think, God, what must it have been like to be there with a sword, you know, all these people rushing towards you, and you're going to hack them, and they're going to hack your arms off, you know. <laughs> Absolutely terrifying. How could they do it? We'd just come through the First World War Memorial, and again, some of the things that happened there, what we created, we can create hell on Earth. There's no question about that. People say, why don't the Syrians go back to the cultures because that's what's been happening in Syria and guess where they've been getting their weapons from? Our arms industry. That's how we use our intelligence. We are a very obedient species. We do what authority tells us. That's how we end up with that. So the point about it is that compassion is not this whiffly waffly let's be kind. It is absolutely not that. Compassion is the real determination to address the causes of suffering which are partly rooted in our potentials within our brains. Because that's the only place it can be for this thing to go on and on and on for thousands of years as it has this kind of horror story is amazing. Look at this. Women as property. Chinese foot binding went on for a thousand years. Women would break the feet of their children because that was in the culture. So genes are important, but the epigenetic uh, process is important, and so is the culture. And it's how these interact and interplay that is so fundamental for understanding how our minds work and how we can bring out the best and the worst in us. So we have all of this potential over here. There's no question about that. And that has dominated the last few thousand years. But we also have this potential over here. Human nature is not a set thing. It's a whole range of possibilities because human nature is very adaptive to its social niche and understanding how we create social niches. If you want to create that, then vote for these people. If you want to create that, then you need to vote for those people. So in the end, in a democracy, it comes to do we vote for the dark side or not. These are also related to different brain systems, different physiologies, genes and epigenetics. So we know that these operate differently in the brain, which do we cultivate? We also know that the uh, different motives, people who are motivated for peace and fairness and care, these are different from people who are motivated to maintain their group boundaries and so on. And the other thing I want to say to you quite clearly is that <clears throat> we use a lot of dissociative defenses. People think, oh well, you know, dissociation is part of what happens in the clinic, but it isn't. 
in order for us to do some of the horrific things that we do, we use, we dissociate all the time. We just put out of our mind, we don't focus on, we don't allow the suffering that we're causing coming into our mind. And this, is a, this has serious implications in, in politics because uh, politicians are very keen on helping us to dissociate. So it's all really about the seeds that we want to um, the seeds that we want to cultivate in the mind. So evolution is extremely important, no doubt about that. Your gene built, no doubt about that. The epigenetic profiles that get turned on in you are related to the environment, no doubt about that. Different potentials are laid down in your brain as a result of uh, solutions to evolutionary challenges, no doubt about that. The question is, we're at a point in our history where we can begin to think about if you stimulate the dark side, you will get the dark side. History has shown repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly that humans are potentially a very nasty species indeed. So the whole question that myself and various others in the field of science, evolutionary, clinical psychology, all of these fields, all of these fields really, they're all the same as trying to find one thing. How can we understand our brains, our cultures, our ways of living, our politics, our business, so that we can live a life where we try as best we can to be helpful and not harmful? They don't have an attachment. Only about 1 or 2% will make it to uh, adulthood. The rest, unfortunately, uh, die before they get to adulthood. But then comes caring behavior. And this is a different kind of reproductive strategy which is to invest in your offspring so that they have a high probability of survival. So rather than producing hundreds, and that will ensure a few of them at least survive, um, this kind of reproductive strategy is to have uh, fewer, but to invest in them and care for them. And one of the things that this carries does is to provide a process of soothing and calming. So, whoops, go back, go back. So there we are, there we are, there we are. Now, I'm going to jump through the, the, to, to humans because what we now know is that babies are very, very uh, sensitive to the human face and the human voice right from a very early age. And here's an example where mother and baby are exchanging um, affection and affiliation and joyfulness in each other's company. And we know that this has a major impact on stimulating parts of this baby's brain. Tragically, uh, babies who are born and have a depressed mother or a withdrawn mother, so they don't get this, this joyful interactions, they have emotional and development delays. So what's important is that the human brain then has evolved and is needing the inputs of a loving parent to stimulate this a whole range of physiological systems for them. Also, <clears throat> the parent is the soothing agent as well as an exciting agent. In fact, babies cannot soothe themselves. They need external soothing. So the basis of caring, re oops, go back. The basis of caring, really, when it comes to being caring, requires us to have an awareness of the need to be nurturing and caring. We are motivated to do it, so I can see that it's needed, and then I'm going to motivate you to do it. We understand what is needed to be done, that we can actually do it, we can express it, and we will change our behavior according to whether it's working or not. And that basically is compassion focused therapy, it's the evolution of caring behavior, which comes with this capacity for awareness, this motivation to be caring, and so on. Now, a little bit of evolution for you. Evolution of caring behavior brings major changes in the physiological regulation of minds and bodies. So, relationships are physiological regulators. And they're very powerful physiological regulators. And the more evolution creates variation and uh, intensity of relating, the more these physiological regulators are important. So, compared to children who are uh, children who are loved and cared for compared to those who are abused and neglected, they have different ex expression, genetic expressions, particularly in the immune system and, and uh, oxytocin genes. 
they have different reactivities to stress the HPA, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the stress system matures in a different way. <clears throat> the immune system matures in a different way. The frontal cortex matures in a different way. Their vulnerability to illness and recovery is different. Their core values are different. Their sense of identities are different. And their capacity for compassion and empathy is different. So these are, if you take the extreme dimensions of being very cared for, being <coughs> neglected or whatever, and their brains are very different. The, the tragic comparison, of course, was the Romanian children who really didn't get any caring at all and they had shrunken brains and all of these were problems. So it's very clear then that however we can think about the evolution of caring behavior, now caring behavior and the experience of being cared for, particularly when we're young, is fundamental to our well-being. John Bowlby was one of the core guys who then talks about the evolution of attachment and he very much talked about the functions of attachment. <clears throat> now these are just some of the functions of caring, but they're quite crucial. One is a proximity-seeking system, the desires for closeness, the movement towards that which is helpful. So when a child is distressed, the child will seek out the parent. Okay? <clears throat> and when the mother hears the distress call of her child, she will seek out the child. So they will, they're moving together. We also know that for young children, when they lose access to their parent, they will show distress. It activates the threat system. So think of a time, <clears throat> maybe when you got lost, <coughs> excuse me, in a big, at a big department store or on the beach or somewhere, and you looked around, you looked around, you, there was, you had no idea where your parent was. What we know is that for most children, not all, but most children, that is a very alarming experience. They become very distressed. Strangers are not usually very helpful to them. They become disorientated. So the removal of their safeness system, which is the parent, take that away, that makes them distressed and it activates the seeking out. And this is true now, I think, for most of us, probably in this room, that when distressful things happen to you, you're probably going to want to talk to somebody who you think cares about you. You're going to want to you'll seek out, you'll phone a friend or a parent or your partner or whatever. So this is very important, the seeking system, the ability to turn towards helpfulness. How do I turn towards what is helpful? <clears throat> the next thing is that the parent provides a secure base, which is a source of security and guidance to go out and explore and develop confidence. <clears throat> And this is important because, um, so when children um, are under stress, the parent is able to just do enough to allow them to engage the stress. So, for example, a child comes back home and says, <clears throat> you know, maybe a seven-year-old child comes back and says, Mum, Mum, you know, Johnny or Sally, they're having a party. But, and they've invited me, but I don't want to go because I don't know anybody. And um, so an anxious mother will say, oh, that's okay. If you're anxious, you don't need to go. Parties are to be enjoyable. If you don't know anybody, you stay with me. Okay? The dismissing parent will say, <clears throat> don't be silly. Parties are to be enjoyed. You know, get on your bike and get there. <laughs> okay? Don't be silly. Just get on and enjoy it. What, what are you making a fuss about? So they dismiss the child's. Uh, whereas a secure-based parent says, okay, yes, they are, so it validates the experience. Yes, they are scary, specifically if you don't know anybody. So tell you what, <clears throat> I'll come with you, stand outside the door, and if after 10 minutes or so you don't like it, then okay, I'll take you home. Because that parent knows that if I provide them a secure base, they get in there, they, they'll be fine. They just need to get over that anxiety, and then they'll be fine. So a secure base is the providing the opportunities for learning, but also the comfort confidence to engage with things that can be a little bit tricky, a little bit... Thing. And then the third thing <clears throat> is called a safe haven. And this is the ability to be soothed and comforted. So whoever you turn to has to have soothing qualities, so the parent has to have a soothing quality. Now we know tragically that for some children the parent is not very soothing uh, for various reasons, or the child might actually be frightened to go to the parent for comfort because the parent is aggressive or whatever. 
But those are the three main functions uh, in the attachment. So the, the seeking out, to provide a base for exploration and growth, and to be a source of calming and grounding when things get a little out of hand. <coughs> so there we are. Now, <coughs> of course, we also know that um, this is not, caring is not just extended in the child family relationship, but actually now humans have a potential to be extraordinarily caring uh, individuals. They have this terrible dark side, but we also have this wonderful side. I mean, we have, um, oh, social spot, wrong, sorry. <coughs> anyway, it's a compassion audience, so you'll forgive me. Um, <coughs> We have cured the world of smallpox. I mean, medicine is, uh, is amazing. You know, We are fantastic teachers. I mean, there are so many wonderful things that we do. And one of the reasons for that is called the social brain hypothesis. And this relates to the challenges of living in small groups where your reputation, having a reputation in your relationship is very important. Altruism is attractive in small groups. Being a help, being seen as helpful rather than Harmful is very important. Um, help with feeding is important, okay? Because <clears throat> we know that in early hunter-gatherer societies there was a lot of food sharing going on. And as I mentioned before, help with reproducing and childcare was very important as well. So those are some of the social challenges and they give rise to all these outcomes. Upright walking, which is linked to kin support. You need more kin support if you're birthing process is difficult from your mother or your grandmother and so forth. Peer support becomes very important. And this is, in, you can see this in um, many of the stories, of human stories, the, the fact that we do not leave one of our colleagues behind. So, <clears throat> for example, if I go hunting and get lost and I know people will come and look for me, uh, this is going to give me a lot more confidence in hunting than if I thought to myself, oh, they'd be delighted if I don't come back. You know, one less mouth to feed. And there are many stories and wonderful movies about how we don't leave people behind. You know, we, we, go, and, we go and find them. There's a, I don't know if you saw The Martian, a classic archetypal story about going back to, to rescue one of our own. So peer support is, it was, became extremely important and also the whole issue of cooperation. Humans are cooperators par excellence. Okay? Approval and support seeking, we're very approval seeking, we're always wanting to be approved of by our parents or by whoever. And we engage in caring and sharing. Now I, when I wrote some stuff back in the 80s I was very interested in this dimension, the process of sharing. Humans share all the time. <clears throat> And they also share their knowledge. If you go onto YouTube, I'm a guitar player, right? Go onto YouTube. I mean, there are thousands of people on YouTube just showing you how to play guitar. I mean, it's incredible. They don't want any money. I mean, some of them say, sign up to my website. But it's just amazing. Humans love to demonstrate their knowledge. They love to share their knowledge with people. Now, there are all kinds of reasons why that might be, because it gives you reputations. Having good reputations gives you better allies, better mates, and all the rest of it. But the point about it is these are motives that are very powerful in humans. And these motives are also <clears throat> powering social intelligence and social competency. So that the more that we, so language, for example, with all of that stuff, language actually starts to evolve because it facilitates these processes, complex empathy, imagination, metacognition. So <clears throat> we've got a whole system going now then, that beginning with attachment, and some of the mechanisms for attachments to provide for the infant now becomes utilized in uh, peer group relationships and then you know, small band group relationships. And these are serving different functions. Okay, so what we've got then is mammalian caring behavior, that's basic. Okay, but then we have this stuff and that's what gives rise to compassion. So compassion is different to basic caring. <clears throat> Because we can knowingly, understanding, being empathic, understand what it is that people's need, we can work out why they're suffering. Okay, and we can knowingly choose to try to help using our wisdom. So many animals will, will may well try to help others in distress or get, and rescue them, but they don't have these amazing cognitive capacities that we do. One small point, which is, uh, again, I, I didn't realize this, uh, this slide was in here, but it might be useful for you because 
we do work with veterans. Now remember I said there were three circles, right? The green circle is a soothing system, and that's the system that the safe base and secure haven, uh, sorry, um, secure base safe haven work with. It's the calming system. <clears throat> it's the attachment system. When our veterans go to war, okay, they go off to war, what happens is their brains get rewired so that the secure base and the safe haven become their buddies. So when they go off on sorties and they have high, you know, high arousal and dopamine, they get very anxious and they get hyped up. They come back to base and they calm down with their buddies and they share experiences with their buddies and they get soothed by their buddies, right? All well and good. When they come back off of tour, however, that system is not working anymore. So they'll come back and they'll feel agitated, just like that child that got lost in the, in the shop, right? They start having that sense of, yeah, but where's my security? Where's my safeness? And of course, for some of them, it's just very confusing because they say, why am I anxious? What's the matter with me? Why do I want to just be back with my buddies? I'm back home now with my family. Why do I feel so anxious? Because your family is not your secure base anymore. Your brain's being rewired, right? So just helping these veterans understand these simple principles is really important because otherwise they can become very self-blaming. Then they get into drinking and to try to... Because nobody has told them it's not just the threat system you need to worry about. It's the regulator of the threat system. It's that soothing system, right? It's very important. So I thought I'd just share that. So how does it work? Well, this is your autonomic nervous system. <clears throat> you have two parts to it. Sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And um, the, paras the sympathetic speeds up things and the parasympathetic slows things down. It's your break, really. If, if we give you a drug to knock out your parasympathetic system, your heart rate will float up to 120 beats per minute. But with a parasympathetic, it'll be down 60 to 90, average. So every beat, your heart, your heart rate is speeding up slightly and slowing down slightly because your parasympathetic system is constantly acting as a brake, a regulator. And sometimes it's called the parasympathetic or the vagal brake. This is important because when you get stressed, the first thing that happens is the parasympathetic takes it, releases the brake, comes off, the brake comes off. So this breaking of your sympathetic system is really quite important, okay, to keep your sympathetic system in check. And this is the vagus, here it is. The vagus means wanderings, it goes all over the body, okay, and it has this uh, effect of calming and relaxing, that's what it's doing. Now, vagal tone, the tone of your vagus is related to calm states experiencing more positive states, <clears throat> lower blood pressure. Also, how you breathe is very important for the vagus. And one of the things that we do a lot of training in is breathing exercise, because as you can imagine, many of our clients, their vagus system, the vagus nerve is not working very well. They, they're not able to downregulate stress responses. <clears throat> Mindfulness increases the tone of the vagus. But what's also very interesting is that the vagus, this calming down, is very much linked to affiliative signals, friendly signals in the face. Imagine that you have to go to a party and you think you don't know anybody, but it's your boss who's putting on this party and you want to impress him or her. So you think, oh, I don't really want to go, I don't know anybody. <clears throat> and so, it's like a little child, isn't it? Um, so then you go, and as you walk through the door, you see your best friend is by the bar. What immediately happens is, oh, there's a massive change in your physiological state. Oh, because now you feel safe. Oh, now there's somebody there I know and I can be friends with and so on and so on. So we know that friendship has a very major impact on this. Uh, that's heart rate variability, won't take a threat. So, <clears throat> so when we're developing compassion, we're teaching people how to develop a compassionate mind then, what we're doing is we're inviting them to think about a part of themselves that could act as a secure base and as a safe haven and be validated. And we teach them how to do that, right? Okay, so <clears throat> for example, if you were, supposing you were feeling 
depressed or stressed, what kind of signal would help you to be able to tolerate or work with that? So it's not going to be a self-critical signal, is it? Okay. <clears throat> this provides opportunities for these three. Now, differentiation means that by creating this in your mind so that you create a sense of yourself that's able to calm down, slow down, that you actually turn to, you think about, and you use as a secure base and safe haven. <coughs> this is going to help you differentiate your emotions because <clears throat> a lot of our clients are what we call undifferentiated. So inside their head is a smoothie <laughs> rather than a fruit salad. So if you ask them, okay, you had an argument with your partner last night, so how are you feeling? They say, well, I just feel terrible. Or what do you mean? I don't know. I just feel bad, you know, just terrible. They're not able to say to you, well, actually, part of me is kind of angry because we had this argument so many times and he just won't listen. But there's another part of me that gets anxious because I'm thinking, well, yeah, we shouldn't really be having these arguments. And what happens if it gets out of control? And there's another part of me that just feels sad because I didn't want to have an argument, you know what I mean? So with differentiation, we begin to recognize that we can have multiple feelings at the same time and multiple motivations at the same time. So we learn that our heads are basically fruit salads. They're not smoothies, right? So differentiation is the ability to recognize. So this is important clinically because if I have a depressed person come in and they say to me, um, oh, I'm depressed because last night you know, I had an argument with my partner. and Oh, dear. And you say, well, how... What do you, you feel? I just feel depressed. Anything else? No. What about anger? Were you angry with your partner? Oh, Dr. Gilbert, I don't do anger. <laughs> no, no, I'm not an angry person. You must never think I'm an angry person. I can't see the point of anger. I just don't do it. I won't go there. I won't go there. <laughs> so as soon as they say that, I know exactly what emotion I'm going to go after. Because they can't process that. Now, that is their anger is their power and their assertiveness, so they need that part. If I get an aggressive guy comes in and says, I had an argument with my wife last night, and I really just got to tell her, I just got to tell her what I think. You say, well, is there any part of you that was kind of sad because you wanted to have a loving... Don't talk to me about sadness. I don't do that shit. Paul Gilbert. <laughs> I don't do that. I don't do sadness. Look at me, man. I'm telling you, I don't do it, right? You're not doing any of that sadness to me, mate. So <clears throat> these guys are actually terrified of anything to do with a sense of vulnerability. And they hate crying because <clears throat> when you cry, you can't see, you can't breathe, you're, you've gone floppy. And for aggressive guys who learn to do this, to defend themselves through their life, it just scares the hell out of them because they can't defend themselves. So they, they really do, they won't allow you. So by creating the compassionate self, you're creating the courage to work with the emotions that you're frightened of. So that means you can tolerate them, then you can integrate them, and that produces a transforming process. Because so much of what we deal clinically are for people who are really avoiding basic stuff that's going on. So when we do this then, <clears throat> we're then bringing online the vagus, oxytocin, and the frontal cortex. There's a whole suite of emotional systems, <clears throat> physiological systems, that are biologically linked to this because of evolution. Evolution, through attachment, and through affiliation means that these are the systems that are running those programs. And when you do that, what you, know, what you can then show is that if you bring that online, then you help people to settle down their threat systems, the sympathetic arousal and the HPA, because the vagus, get the vagus working, the vagus will settle the, parasymp the sympathetic system, and there are oxytocin receptors in the amygdala. We know, for example, that... If women are going for uh, um, <clears throat> uh, x-rays, mammograms for potential breast cancer, and they go with their husbands and they're allowed to hold their husbands' hands, provided they've got good relationships, course, their cortisol levels are much lower. <clears throat> so this ability to have caring from the outside, but also to be caring on the inside is important. So this means that then, when we develop a compassionate mind, we're developing a capacity within the self. And I'm going to show you how you do that, and then I'll finish. And this part of you is able to empathize, tolerate these emotions. Whereas if these emotions, if your threat system emotions run your show, and they will because they're designed to, and if you haven't learned how to kind of stand back from them, then anger will just do what anger does. Anxiety will do what anxiety does. So what happens is for these individuals that we work with, they're 
being run by single programs, basic algorithms are running the show and running their bodies and making them feel terrible. So the point about it is then, if you've only got a critical mind, and many of our clients do have, they become up. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed the show. If you'd like to hear the full version, you can do so with the Weekend University Premium Membership. This gets you access to our master library of over 230 talks and interviews with the world's leading psychologists, professors, and authors, as well as transcripts, CPD certification, quizzes, and unlimited access to the recordings from our annual conferences. For more information, please go to theweekenduniversity.com forward slash membership.